Hi, this is Seth Cohen from the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the University of Washington, and we're going to be talking about Clostridium difficile, aka C. diff. The learning objectives are to describe the epidemiology and important risk factors for C. diff infection, to learn how to make the diagnosis, and to be aware of prevention and treatment strategies for C. diff. C. diff is a gram-positive bacteria, and it falls under the interesting category of gram-positive rods, some of which are addressed elsewhere. Other diseases caused by gram-positive rods include tetanus, botulism, anthrax, listeria. However, many other gram-positive rods are also common skin contaminants. The gram stain on the right shows rod-shaped bacteria. Because they stain purple, you know that they are gram-positive. C. diff is anaerobic, and one of the hallmarks of C. diff pathogenesis is spore formation. You can actually see the spores on the gram stain in the areas of lighter purple, which is kind of cool. Spores are ingested by the fecal-oral root and are extremely hardy in the environment. Toxin production, which we will discuss, is also a key feature of the disease. Other clostridia, such as Clostridium tetani, which is the causative agent of tetanus, or C. botulinum, which is the causative agent of botulism, also produce spores and toxins. Why is C. diff so important? Well, it's the most common cause of healthcare-associated diarrhea. There are actually a few different strains in circulation. Since the early 2000s, it was noticed that certain epidemics of C. diff had increased mortality and morbidity. The strain behind these epidemics was given the cumbersome name of the NAP1-BI-027 strain. You can call it the NAP1 strain for short, and it still remains in circulation today. Interestingly, asymptomatic carriage of C. diff is also common. About 20 to 50 percent of nursing home and hospitalized patients are asymptomatic C. diff carriers and serve as important reservoirs for infection. Patients who are colonized can spread disease to other vulnerable patients in the hospital or in the healthcare setting. So how does C. diff infection occur? Well, there are essentially two major events in the pathogenesis of C. diff infection. The first is a disruption of GI flora, and we'll talk more about this under risk factors. The second is acquisition of a toxin-producing strain. Some strains do not produce toxins and may actually be normal colonizers of the colon. The most common scenario is that your GI flora is disrupted, usually due to antibiotic use. Spores live in the environment and are resistant to heat, antibiotics, acid, and are quite difficult to kill. As with so many other infectious diseases, C. diff spores are acquired via the fecal-oral route and develop into a vegetative or active form once in the colon. This has implications when we talk about infection control precautions later on. Importantly, this organism itself is not invasive, and non-toxin-producing strains can be normal colonizers in a small percent of people. All of the clinical manifestations are due to the toxins that this bug elaborates. They cause inflammation, diarrhea, and disrupt tight junctions in colonic epithelial cells. Toxin A activates neutrophils, which may in part help explain why C. diff is so commonly associated with leukocytosis. Toxin B is much more potent and responsible for many of the symptoms of severe disease. So any antibiotic can disrupt GI flora, but those most commonly implicated include the fluoroquinolones, clindamycin, and other broad-spectrum antibiotics such as cephalosporins. Even vancomycin and metronidazole, which are part of the treatment of C. diff, as we'll see later on, can predispose to C. diff disease under the right conditions. Age is a major risk factor as is severe illness. Gastric acid suppression in the form of proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers. Gastric acid suppression in the form of proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers, which for a while everybody seemed to have been on for acid reflux, is also associated with C. diff, presumably because gastric acid is part of our normal host defenses, particularly for the pathogens that are acquired through the fecal oral route. Chemotherapy can not only cause immunosuppression, but may also disrupt gut flora in many cases. And unfortunately, community-acquired cases without classic risk factors are increasingly reported. The clinical manifestations of C. diff run a spectrum ranging from asymptomatic colonization to watery diarrhea, which would be the most common, to a life-threatening complication called toxic megacolon. Unexplained leukocytosis may reflect brewing C. diff infection in over half of hospitalized patients. Fever is often absent in mild or moderate disease, and the feared complications include fulminant colitis or toxic megacolon. Toxic megacolon is a severe colonic dilation combined with symptoms of systemic toxicity. It may require urgent surgical consultation. It can lead to bowel perforation and shock. So how do we make the diagnosis of C. diff? 
Well, hospitalized patients with three or more loose stools a day and any suspicion for C. diff should be evaluated. The most common test is a PCR for stool toxin, which is rapid and has excellent sensitivity and specificity. Remember that initial culture results of C. diff on their own will not give us good information regarding whether a patient is harboring a toxin-producing strain or not. EIA is a less commonly performed assay. In challenging cases, such as trying to distinguish between C. diff and inflammatory bowel disease, colonoscopy may be performed. Findings on colo range from inflammation and ulceration to pseudomembranes, which are thought to be nearly pathognomonic for this disease. Pseudomembranes are whitish plaques that adhere to the colon and are formed by aggregates of inflammatory cells and proteins. Thus, the findings of pseudomembranous colitis is highly suggestive of C. diff. You can see pictures of these pseudomembranes from a patient's colonoscopy image on the right. Unfortunately, many patients develop C. diff because of antibiotic overuse. We treat any symptomatic patient who has a positive stool PCR. Because a positive assay may lag behind clinical response, asymptomatic patients with a positive assay generally do not need to be treated. At many centers, the choice of antibiotic is based on whether a patient is deemed to have severe or non-severe disease. There are a number of criteria for severe disease, taking into account fever, leukocytosis, a patient's age, and severity of illness. Oral vancomycin, which acts directly on the gut without systemic absorption, has been shown to be superior to metronidazole for severe disease. One of the challenges of treating C. diff is its propensity to relapse, particularly in the setting of subsequent antibiotic use. Some patients can end up on prolonged courses of vancomycin, lasting months in an attempt to suppress or eradicate C. diff carriage. FMT, or fecal microbiota transplant, is the technical term for stool transplant, a procedure that is currently being widely adopted as the treatment for relapsed or refractory C. diff based on a well-constructed randomized clinical trial. Stool is instilled in the colon, usually via colonoscopy, enema, or a nasogastric tube. The cure rates are remarkably high and are thought to be durable with a low risk of response unless the patient is again exposed to broad-spectrum antibiotics. The rate of FMT procedures will only become more common as FMT continues to gain widespread acceptance by the general public and the medical community. Prevention of C. diff is a huge issue in healthcare facilities. Prevention of C. diff is a huge issue in healthcare facilities. Contact or enteric precautions means gown, glove, and disposable medical equipment when possible, since any article of clothing or equipment, including your own white coat, your tie, your stethoscope, can serve as a vector for C. diff spores. This is one case in which hand hygiene must be done with soap and water. Unfortunately, alcohol-based hand rubs and gels do not get rid of the spores. In addition to antibiotic stewardship, we must also try to limit gastric acid suppression when possible. Just as a reminder, wash your hands with soap and water when you see a patient with C. diff. This brings us to the end of this lecture on C. diff. Thanks so much for watching, and be careful who you give antibiotics to.